Hello, everybody. Welcome back to A Few Minutes of History. I'm your host, Jake, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. I am joined by Ricky Phillips. Ricky, how are you today? Hello, Jake. Very, very good to be here. Thank you. I'm pretty well. Perfect. No, it's uh, thank you for coming on. We uh, been looking forward to doing this one for a while, so it's it's great that we can we can get together and uh, finally get it out there. Well, we've been dancing around each other for a little while, haven't we? So, uh, <laughs> and of course, you, you know, we're talking about the uh, the new book, and um, you know, as as I pointed out to you uh, early when we were we were chatting off off mic, so to speak. You know, you you are the exclusive at the moment. Um, you know, anyone wants to know what it's about, they come to you. So. Um, Let's hope we do it justice. No, absolutely. And uh, thank you for making me, uh, let, well, allowing me to be the first. And we are obviously talking about your new book, which is called Phoenix and Belgrano, The Life and Death of a Warship. Now, obviously, the Belgrano famous for really one incident, isn't it, in, in the Falklands yeah. War? But it had an incredibly extensive life before that, Mickey. And obviously, your new book is writing about that. So what was it about the Belgrano that, drew you in that you wanted to write this story well I think it's um you know I, w- I was looking for a new project and obviously I've, I've kind of become you know that that Falklands guy and uh, <laughs> I, w- I was very much looking for a new project and initially um I had I had a I've, I've got like the the bigger books you know first casualty last letters from Stanley uh, and then I've got the pictorial histories which I covered uh the Argentine inventions and weapons at the, the Falklands War and a pictorial history of the invasion. And I originally came up with all these these pictures that I had never seen, that, that most people had never seen, about the Belgrano. And I thought, oh, that that, that could work. You know, so it was going to be a, a short sort of pictorial history. And then I, as I just sort of started looking into it, I suddenly realized the the level and the depth of, of uh, misunderstanding, opinion, things like that. And so I sort of started getting into thinking. And sometimes this is this is just how historians write books you know you don't sort of sit i'm going to write a book about this you know sometimes sometimes occasionally we do um but the more you start looking into something um the more interesting it gets you know and if 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 you you tend to sort of move away and do other things in your life and then you find that this is still sort of niggling in the brain that you've got to you've got to get this down i always say if it's still going after three days you know you've got to write a book about it uh, <laughs> that becomes a year of your life and um it just the more I wrote, the more fascinating it got. And when I started looking, obviously on um, Twitter, I still can't call it X. I'm sorry, it's not X. It's Twitter. Everyone knows it's Twitter. <laughs> um, on Twitter, I you know I have obviously the the big following on Twitter, and just looking through where the engagement was, and I found that Belgrano was obviously a big one, and it, it, it's the biggest incident of the war. I think if you. Uh, if you go and speak to laymen in the street and say, tell me something, something about the Falklands War. So what's synonymous with it? Uh, Belgrano, you know, there's that and Black Buck. Um, Andrew Bird, of course, a brilliant historian, um, just did uh, an excellent book on on the Black Buck missions, which um, he tells me, and I have no reason to disbelieve it, that it sort of, it takes a lot more on from uh, even what Roland White did. Um uh, I haven't read it yet, and I've been very much looking forward to reading it. I obviously have my own projects at the moment. So <laughs> Andrew Bird covered Black Buck. It's gone incredibly well, um, and his history is is bang on. Uh, the chats we've had, you know, um, between us, I, I just from the knowledge of the man, I would certainly recommend that. But um, the Bograno was just, and, and I'm a very much a Warship fan, and, the, you know, the more I got into it, the more it drew me in. So what was going to be probably a 100-page little little pictorial history became the biggest book I've ever written. I think it's 431 pages. And um, I think where, where it uh, started to grow legs, you know, I said, oh God, yeah, the sinking of the Belgrano, everyone does that. And it was kind of something I, I normally start with my intro or foreword and I'm, I'm kind of spitballing. I'm kind of, I can always change it later, but I'm seeing where I'm going with it. And um, it was something I just came out with that the kind of, you mentioned it here that the, the Belgrano is a little bit like the Titanic, you know, it's only famous for sinking. Um, yeah. And of course she had a whole nother life from, um, uh, from 1938 uh, onwards, you know, she was USS Phoenix. She was a Pearl Harbor survivor. Um, she fought in, in the, the biggest sea battle ever fought later Gulf. Um, it was a, a big part of it, the battle of Suriego Strait. But the more I read, the more fascinating this got. And it suddenly, it, it as many history books do, it became a thing of itself, if you see what I mean. 
<laughs> no, absolutely. And I think it's I think it's it's good that you've gone back to to its war history as well, you know, Second World War history, because like you said, you know, it, surviving Pearl Harbor and, and Leyte Gulf, they're massive, you know, massive things in themselves, aren't they? Which could be, you know, a book all all on its own. So to to to, to do that and then obviously go on to its its Argentinian service as well is is it's a, it's, a, it's a topic, a big topic to take on. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, it's um, one of the fun things when when I was younger. I mean, I, I've been collecting military history books since I was, I don't know, probably 10 or less, you know, and um, 45 now getting old. But um, I remember this book, the, the Guinness Book of Military Blunders, and it's got these these wonderful little quotes in it, you know, like the stupidest things ever said. And I remember as you open it, it had it's probably nothing and it just said um uh us radar operator at pearl harbor now that wasn't entirely true in fact the radar operators could see these things coming in it was a new radar they did very little practice on it and they radio it in and it was a guy with a wonderful name kermit tyler uh, le- uh american <laughs> lieutenant kermit i mean you know if it's going to go wrong it happens to kermit and um he is the one who said it's probably nothing. Forget about it. And um, and it was considered like the number one stupidest thing anyone ever said. Uh, poor old Kermit Tyler. I mean, he, he ended up as a I think he ended up as a, a colonel or something like that. And he was cleared of all charges. He was he was the new guy on the job, the new officer on base. Everyone else had a hangover and they basically just stuck him on the rubbish shift and he didn't know what he was doing. Um so it was automatically when you look at this, you think, oh, I've got to get that in. And then you start looking at it and there were the accounts from uh, Pearl Harbor. And this was the first bit of World War Two history I'd ever done, which should not be. It's people. It's people shooting each other, blowing each other up. It's narrative military history. I've done a lot from, you know, from Hannibal to Napoleon to to football. <laughs> well. so it was no different, but it was immense fun. And um, the, the funny thing is, you know, when you when you look back particularly again going back to social media to twitter and you look back at opinions and i'm sure we'll talk about this later the opinions over Mm. belgrano and the sinking but even over phoenix at pearl harbor i saw this just yesterday someone said she was sunk at pearl harbor and raised again i was like no she wasn't (laughs) no she wasn't (laughs) one of the best things about writing pearl harbor from the perspective of uss phoenix is that she's on the periphery so if you're on you know um one of the one of the the big battleships that w- that was hit there, you know, Arizona or something. Mm. Um, all you see is, and all you can recount is, there's a load of planes, torpedoes are hitting us everywhere, explosions, fire. But you you're looking at what's immediately in front of you. Whereas Phoenix on the periphery had a lot of action, a lot of activity. They were absolutely fighting for their lives, but they had a wonderful grandstand view. And this is mm. something that they could could recount. And um, so instantly from you know, I, I open at Pearl Harbor. Instantly at, from Pearl Harbor, you realize that this is a ship that's and a crew that is, that is doing incredible things. This is a story that we can run with, you know? No, absolutely. And like you said, it. I think it's interesting that the Phoenix wasn't, you know, say the Arizona or something like that, where, it, like you said, they have the view of what everything else is going on. So you can get that real incredible you can build the story from there, can't you? Rather than the one fixated moment, which everyone always thinks about with Pearl Harbor, which is the Arizona or the Utah, for instance, yeah. or you know the airfields being bombed. Whereas the Phoenix got to see all of that happening. <laughs> yeah, and they and they describe it, and it, it's quite interesting. I mean, the um, you know some people, some like I said, this guy the other day, I just happened to say to see it. He, he said, "Oh, she was sunk and raised." No, she wasn't. As other people say, she survived without mm. a scratch. Not entirely true, actually. Um, Phoenix got one twenty millimeter round through one of her uh, fire directors, uh, which they believe was an American one because they were just spraying shots everywhere. <laughs> and um, also, um, in her log, you can see it said she blew out the lining of one of her main guns. And this is this is not true, you know. Um, someone just scribbled it down very post hoc, probably a bit traumatized. It was one of her secondary guns. In fact, people say, oh, they were five inch. They weren't. They were three inch at Pearl Harbor. They were a 1900 design because they hadn't yet got the five inch guns onto her. And what she was firing so fast with all of her secondary guns. Um, one of her three inch guns, literally the whole lining just blew out of it. <laughs> that was it. A 20 millimeter shot and the lining of a gun that they were going to replace anyway was blown out. Um, but what you see 
because they've got a little bit more time, they're not just being mobbed to the point whereby they're on autopilot and trying to hold shots back. You find out what was happening and why, why the anti-aircraft fire was so ineffective. It's because they had a little bit more time to think about this. Um, a lot of it was because they all, because they were in, in port, uh, they were using practice rounds. And so practice rounds, you cannot fuse them to detonate very, very close to the ship. Because if you get someone who doesn't know what they're doing, they might blow mm-hmm. everyone up. So effectively, the only way you could score a hit was with a direct hit, not with an airburst that's going to get someone. And so they were literally just throwing lead into the air, quite literally. Um, the guys on like Arizona or something, if they had a chance to fight, wouldn't have known this. They wouldn't have known. They yeah. were just firing shots. They wouldn't have studied what was happening. Um, a lot of the ammunition was locked away. Um, a lot of the officers were out on leave. It was a nice sunny day. There was a baseball match happening. Um, a lot of the crews were fast asleep the night before. There'd been a, a battle of the bands. All the ship's bands had got together and had this great big battle of the bands. And one band, I can't remember which which battleship it was now, were all asleep in their bunks and the whole lot went down. Um, so it was a quiet, lazy, sunny day in, you know, um, in Pearl Harbor. Paradise. <laughs> up Oahu. Yeah, it was. It was paradise. And, you know, when the planes went over, some people were waving at them. Um, later, some people were stood there realizing how badly armed they were. Some people were throwing bricks at them, um, you know, but when you because you've got that outside uh, mm. view, that grandstand view, you start to get it. And then once you start get, to get into it, the history rolls. You're like, I can't just stop here. And go, And then she was the Belgrano. You've got to run with this. <laughs> this is what we did. No, absolutely. So obviously after Pearl, uh, she obviously stays in the Pacific. So is it was it late a golf after that, or was the next big one for uh, for the Phoenix? Well, Phoenix kind of um, she she develops this uh, reputation, which is which is quite ironic considering that now she's one of the most famous warships sunk, um, mainly of course because of the reason she was sunk and everything else. But she was known as a a lucky ship. She was uh, the lucky Phoenix. A lot of people called her. And um, for the first part of the Pacific War, she goes everywhere where danger almost isn't. You know, she's she's used mm-hmm. for a lot of it as like a floating battery. One of the things that uh, the Brooklyn class cruisers, which is what she was, um, they, they were kind of known as machine gun ships. You know, they've got 15 6.1 inch guns that can fire each. Each one can fire 10 rounds a minute. That's 150 shells a minute, not including her secondary <laughs> batteries of five inch. And the idea was that they would just smother a target. And so as a as a floating battery to get to the islands, the atolls and everything else, they were incredible. And she finds herself on fire support for a lot. And, you know, there's like, oh, there's danger and everyone out of this bit of sea is getting sunk and she'll go out there. Oh, nothing's happening now. You know, and there's a lot of frustration from the crew. And what you find as a as a historian, as a as an author, is that this is actually building tension. You know, when's it going to happen? Like, you know, we're good at hitting some island. Where when's this going to happen? Um, and of course, then then it it finally does. You know, and she has a, quite a few close shaves. I mean, um, it's not just so the Battle of the Leyte Gulf. There's a there, it was sort of a lot of little battles in one one big theater, and the Battle of the Suriego Strait was like the almost like the climax in many ways. And um, the Brooklyn class had been developed to take on a, a Japanese style of cruiser called the Megami. And in, in my second chapter, once we've done with Pearl, we go back and we go to the drawing board. You know, we look at why did the ship exist? Um, we look at all the design specs. We look at designs that they had crazy things going on. They were like, that's a bit, bit silly. But all the ideas <laughs> they came up with and how they built it and why they built it. And it was built to take on this Japanese cruiser called the Megami. And there's this moment where not just the Megami class, but the actual Megami herself, the lead ship of the class, is coming towards you like, yes, it's happening. Oh, no, it doesn't fight. But uh. <laughs> even though that doesn't and they never get to exchange shots. One of the brilliant bits is the Japanese have got this this battleship, the the Fuso. And it was an older battleship, but they they'd done a few bits to it. They got it back into back into service. It's still got great big guns you know 14 inch guns or something the you know phoenix has only got 6.1 inch guns and they meet at this battle and i mean phoenix just batters it into atoms i mean it has not got a chance you know this is like watching um 
you know, like watching Muhammad Ali take on some some big hard hitting pug, you know, he's just dancing around and just whacking. <laughs> and it, it was a brilliant, um, again, brilliant chapter. And it was a, a brilliant battle to be fought, a complete annihilation. Um, and there are some wonderful photos of it as well. But Phoenix doesn't just do this. I mean, when you go into the, then you go into the, the kamikaze phase of the war mm. and these operations where, you know, you've got torpedo bombers, dive bombers, kamikazes, everything coming at her. Um, and again, I mean, miraculously, she survives. One of the, one of the uh, interesting things is, is that USS Phoenix lost one crewman in the entire war, one man killed. And it was a bomb hit the water ju- just by the stern of the ship. And it um, exploded or de- deflagrated, as they say, it splintered everywhere. And a bit of uh, splinter killed one guy, injured a few others. Um, did a bit of damage to the the rudder, I think, on one, one of the propellers. But that was as close as she got. But she was so close. Every other ship, there were nine Brooklyn class cruisers, and every other one. I mean, they could take one hell of a hit. They really, really could. And even just going through the damage on all of them and what they could take. Um, but the damage that was done to them was was incredible. One of the interesting points, um, the best one of the class. She was. The, the last model out, so to speak, USS St. Louis, um, she actually is the only one sunk in the war. And interestingly enough, she's hit by torpedoes just just after the armor belt and just on uh, on the bow, on the left, on the port side, the left-hand side, exactly where Belgrano, as she became, was actually hit. So she was torpedoed in the same way. And so there's uh-huh. even a side bit where we look and say, okay, so why was this an Achilles heel? What happened? I even go into the difference between, uh, and this is in the historical notes. I'm well known for the historical notes in my books, which become a sort of a book in themselves. But the difference between a Japanese long lance Shimo's head torpedo and a British um, uh, Mark VIII Torpex head torpedo, and why was the damage different and what happened? And it, so this is the kind of level of detail we go into if you need it. You know, it's still good Ricky narrative history, which everyone knows me for, but the level of detail on it on the side is is pretty damn big and it's fascinating to look at the, the at the phoenix but also all of her sister ships throughout the war gives you a really good idea of the damage they could cause and the damage they could take as well and that really brings what happens later into context mm, absolutely so obviously after the war she's uh she's decommissioned isn't she and she gets does she get bought by the argentinians or is it you know is she gifted to them how, how does uh how does the phoenix become the belgrano <laughs> so uh yeah she comes back and in in the um uh 1950 to 51 period the u.s realized that she's um it's terrible this ship has done all this service and it's considered uh no longer required for the defense of the united states um so they have eight of these cruisers left. Obviously, St. Louis has been sunk. The U.S. decide to keep two, and they decide to sell two each to South American countries. So Brazil uh, buys two of them. Chile buys two of them. Argentina buys two of them. And this is another thing. Most people don't realize that Argentina had two of these. Mm-hmm. Um, USS Boys became the RA 9th of Julio, or 9th of July. and um, so. Argentina actually had two of these cruisers, uh, not just the one, but um, and and even in Argentine service. I mean, obviously, once we go from there, we it's a two part book. You know, we go from her yeah. U.S. service into her Argentine service, and she was certainly her and boys with or Nova Julia were the the very much the pride of the Argentine navy, and they had big ships, but they were getting old and they'd retired them. Um, I even go into the little bit in the forties when. Britain's back is turned. We're fighting World War Two, and the Argentines come up with this this plan to invade the Falklands using all of these ships and everything else, and the, what the plan was, and kind of why it it didn't go ahead. So I cover that because um, this is all a big part of what happens later, of course. But as the Belgrano, she goes on. I mean, she's pivotal in in uh, toppling Peron in in you know one of their first sort of big big revolutions and there was a whole sort of civil war going on between the the argentine air force and the navy and the army were kind of split different ways um so there's a lot of history in which she's involved um and she's even uh things we don't hear about um things like argentina had a massive issue with illegal fishing from so from the soviet bloc 
countries, um, Russia and Bulgaria particularly, and these massive factory ships. And they, they were literally, they were laughing at the Argentine Navy. They'd go out and fire a few shots across their bow and they're like, <laughs> you're not going to do anything. So one day they send the Belgrano and they're like, no, they're still not going to do anything. And then the Belgrano just starts pummeling the hell out of uh, out of factory <laughs> ships. And they're like, oh, you mean it? You know, um, but in this, this sort of interwar period, we also get them. Um, the modifications, the upgrades, um, you know, there was a lot of studies done on the ship. You know, it's getting older. What can we do? Uh, what, what what just needs a patch up? I can't do miracles. And what can we really work with? And the upgrades to the ship uh, as they go, as she goes through the years are incredible to list down. And, you know, to find all the information on that and everything else on this is, it's been a lot of work. Um, mm. But uh, it, it it's one of the things that you find that she's, you know, when we go in later and we talk about, you know, I think the British during the during the Falklands War, if I bolt a few phrases together, they said she was sort of a clapped out old cruiser held together with bailing wire. But um, but this this was not the tr- the true story. You know, it was a bit like in World War Two when pictures caricatured the Japanese as basically monkeys with great big, huge glasses on riding bicycles mm. and everyone would laugh at them and suddenly, oh, oh, they, they mean business. Um so we look at, you know, what a potent ship she was. And um, she wins. Uh, they, they had the, the Naval Prize and uh, La Prensa, the uh, Argentine newspaper, had its own gunnery prize as well. And Belgrano was winning gunnery prizes for accuracy and everything else every single year. She had a massive trophy cabinet. Um, so, you know, there's a lot in the interwar years. And we learn a lot about the ship and her crews and her capabilities, you know. Um, just because she's not technically blowing anyone up, up other than the mm. factory ship, um, she's doing a lot, so to speak. No, absolutely. So, um, so obviously she has a busy time, and then obviously when the Falklands War begins, what's her role initially in that conflict? Well, it's one of the it's it's one of the first things you realise is that you know the the Argentine task force, big task force, basically every ship afloat goes out there to invade the Falcons, except for one, Belgrano. Um, now, she was undergoing a refit at the time. And again, you you will read um, you will read people saying, oh, her, her guns were knackered, etc. They were not. Um, there was a lot they couldn't do with that ship. It was getting too old, and they basically stripped Noid de Julio, her sister ship, to keep her going. One of the things you won't read almost anywhere is that Belgrano had brand new guns. A company uh hoffman was the name um gunsmiths they they made the argentine 6.1 inch or 155 millimeter field howitzers they remade the guns of that ship they said look she can't keep up the speed she used to she can't do everything she used to we can give her brand new guns and they did and (laughs) obviously advances in gun technology and um ballistics and artillery had gone on, that was, they could fire at much higher pressures than a field piece. Otherwise, you fire that at maximum pressure, it's, it's catapulting backwards across the field with the recoil. And the range that Belgrano had was huge. Um, initially, they weren't sure what to do with her. So they, they sent her down south uh, to the Beagle Channel. And there was a erroneous report that um, HMS Exeter had gone down uh, the other side of Chile with what they thought was a support tanker to come around and get at the Falklands from the south. Actually, it wasn't. It was the old county class destroyer HMS Norfolk, which had been sold to Chile. And the fleet auxiliary we sent with it was, I think it was Tidepool, was it? I have to check that. But it, it, that was going to be sold to Chile. And we said, oh, actually, can we have that back for a bit? So we did. So it was <laughs> a non-event. And they they were kind of sat there, right, what do we do with her? Meanwhile, of course, South Georgia falls. It's obviously the Fultons is next. There's the total exclusion zone, which is obviously a massive thing. The 200 mile mm. exclusion zone set up around the islands. And um, as the British move in, the, the Argentines have this sort of plan. Um, it becomes sort of colloquially known as Lombardo's Trident. So Admiral Lombardo was sort of the, the head of the Navy outside. Anaya was the junta head of the Navy, but Lombardo was operational head. And it's sort of a, not just a pincer movement around the islands to north and south, but there's actually another movement coming around behind the British task force. Plus, they're going to send two super etendards armed with exocets to really break them up. And they've got the submarine San Luis, which is already inside the exclusion zone. The idea is 
they were absolutely convinced that the British would turn up and basically do a, a Normandy D-Day job. Just turn up and pile straight onto the beaches and let's have a slugfest. That's how, I don't know why, that's how they assumed we were going to fight the war. And so the idea is that the Navy, the Argentine Navy would suddenly close in around behind the British ship and trap the ships and the men pretty much on the beach. Um, mm. So this is where they were moving towards. As, as our task force is moving towards the Falklands, they are moving around us. But we don't yet have a shooting war. You know, this is the last days of April and there's still peace talks going on and everything else. Nobody really wants to be first to fire. And then May the 1st, the British fire first. Obviously, Black Buck drops all the bombs over Stanley. The Harriers go in over Stanley and Goose Green. Um, there's special forces inserted. There's dogfights in the air and everything else. It's obvious, you know, massive naval bombardments. It's obvious the, the, the shooting war has begun. And the Argentines kind of, they see what they what they want to see, which is pretty common in war. They see this D-Day style invasion turning up. And the orders go in for the net to close, for this pincer to close around the ships. Um, now, this obviously becomes one of the things that uh, we now start to delve into the the whole Belgrano myth, so to speak, the the pea soup that is who knew what, when and why did it happen? I'm sure <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you're a Navy man yourself. Do you, what's your knowledge or impressions on that? I, I don't I don't. I do you mean on the on on the what the Belgrano was doing or why you know it, what what do I think about her sinking or yeah, I, if you take sort of the sinking of the Belgrano as a as a subject so to speak and again I'm talking about uh, you know a lot of people have a lot of impressions over what was what you'd be amazed how many are wrong you know <laughs> so hmm. I just wonder what so, yours were so the 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 uh, from what I've you know sort of gathered on the the sinking is that. The people are very split on what she was doing or where she was going and what she was actually, you know, what what her intentions were, whether she was going to, you know, attack the task force and things like that, and whether she was or was not in the exclusion zone. That's always what I've thought, like, I've gathered is people are very split on what she was actually doing and no one really knows what she was doing. Um, for me personally, you know, it's 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 fair game, and do I think? The Argentines would have done the same to one of our ships. Absolutely. I think if the opportunity was there to sink a British ship, I think they'd have took that opportunity as well. You know. <laughs> so I I think you're you pretty much there, you've hit it on the head, you know. I mean, um, and it's interesting because I, you know, these are opinions I've got, but it's interesting if you said, Well, that's not my opinion, that's not my impression, mm. you know, we we can we can discuss that. But one of the things about the background, as we're talking about this, you know, we come towards this pivotal moment and obviously in in the book as as the narrative goes obviously we slow down as we get to that point because there's so much to be understood um in talking about the again the sinking of the belgrano in a big bubble as a subject um why this became contentious mainly is in january 1984 so we're almost on the the 40th anniversary of it um i've got it here i appreciate your your readers uh sorry readers your listeners i should say won't see this but the sinking of the belgrano by arthur gavshon and desmond rice this book here was the the smoking gun of the entire falcon's war this was michael heseltine after the war <laughs> waved this book in the air and said there will be no watergate here and of course everyone turned it into underwater gates within about half an hour <laughs> um the, the whole sinking of the belgrano thing what a wonderful term profumo without the sex they called it how good is that <laughs> it's a strap it's a strap line i'm sure profumo had a, had a few straps in on himself but uh, um it's obvious that this is a huge thing and the two key points to the um gavshon and rice book well, what what they call the the eight oh seven order, um, which was considered to be so eight oh seven p.m. on May the first, it is claimed by Gavshon and Rice that Belgrano had the order to return to port. Mm. There is a second point uh, which they raise, which is that Belgrano was sunk to ruin the Peruvian peace plan, and. This is something you will hear a lot of. You know, if you fish for opinions on Belgrano online, these are the two. She was she was ordered back to port at eight oh seven, yeah, and that it was all done to ruin the Peruvian peace plan. You will find this anywhere. In fact, 
I'll go so far as to say that there's a, a book out, uh, I think it was last year, and um, it, it was Return to Bomb Alley, The Faulkner's Deception by a uh, veteran of HMS Yarmouth, Paul Cardin. Now, Paul, I, one of the things I should say, I don't talk down about other people's books. I never have. You'd be amazed how many do. I don't. Mm. Um, Paul's, and I spoke to Paul, you know, Paul is very... He's a nice enough guy. He is. But he's very conspiracy theory. He freely admits he's a, he's a, a, a David Icke fan and follower, if you will. And that probably covers a lot of things we could say. Um, and Paul followed the exact same line. Now, I'm not hacking on Paul, but Paul, in fact, went on um, the another podcast, the, the Bought the T-Shirt podcast, which I've been on. And uh, I happened to watch it and I, I get five mentions in that podcast. Uh, apparently, um, you know, myself and Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, the the official historian of the war, are sort of, according to, to Paul, in, in, in cahoots to cover the truth about the Belgrano. And again, he reiterates the 807 order and the Peruvian peace plan. These are the big, big things. In so many ways, this is why, since again, I'm, for your listeners, I'm waving it at the camera here. Um, this is why the Gapshon and Rice book was pretty much the last book in 40 years that really covered this. Now, people say, oh, there was the Rossiter book from 2009. Yes, there was. But Rossiter's Sinking of the Belgrano book from 2009 was basically what were the British doing? It isn't looking at what the Argentines are doing. No one has done that for 40 years because this became a massive hot potato, the Gavshon and Rice book. Mm -hmm. Now, and this is where all of these stories come from, these misunderstandings, these what, what was she doing? And this is kind of all you read. I have an interesting, it's a, it's a reasonably short list, but an interesting list of the orders Belgrano received including the 807 order. Um, and this should hopefully cover quite a few of the um, misunderstandings, if, if I can read this out. Are we ready? Absolutely. Okay, so May the 1st. So she sunk, sunk on the 2nd, May the 1st. The first important order comes through at uh, 3.55. It confirms the British position off the islands is static, that they are well inside the exclusion zone. It now changes the rules of engagement to give complete freedom of action and movement inside or out of the total exclusion zone. So firstly, this is this is obviously an order. Basically, you're free to do what you want. Be prepared mm -hmm. for action. We're going to war. Next order, 807. This is the important one. It calls for direct action the next day, May the 2nd. It is an order to attack. The order is for Belgrano to enter the exclusion zone, and now I'm quoting, to close in on any units south of the islands to within Exocet range. Attack under favourable conditions. I'm going to pause there. The 807 order was the order to withdraw, and it's saying to enter the exclusion zone to within Exocet range, close in on any units, and attack under favourable conditions. So th did that sound to you like an order to withdraw to port? Not particularly. No. no it did <laughs> Unless not. the port is Stanley. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> there was also, we cover that, there was also an, an option that was investigated to sink her in um, just off Port William outside outside Stanley as a, as a static battery. There was actually that option, but that's in the book. I'll leave it for there. We'll go on, though. So we've done 807, the order not to withdraw. Uh, 10.05, uh, a reiteration of the previous orders. Plus, again, quote, approach the enemy to wear them down through missile attacks, taking into account air threat. First time air threat had been mentioned, but again, we're reiterating the 807 order. We now get 12. So mid midnight is 13 minutes past 12 on the 2nd of May to launch a massive attack at the British fleet before any units have a chance to withdraw. Belgrano specifically to advance an attack and sink HMS Hermes. So she's still not going home. Um, so we're up to 13 minutes past 12. Here's an interesting thing. So this is the early hours of 2nd of May, the day Belgrano was sunk. At 2.50 a.m., Admiral Alara, who is in command of the Argentine carrier in the northern group, realizes that he cannot, he's been detected. He doesn't have the wind speed to launch his aircraft. His steam catapult wasn't working. He needed wind speed. The wind had dropped. 2.50, Alara says, we give up. We can't do this. And the northern arm of the pincer was the important one. That was supposed to go in, bomb everyone and everything else. The British fleet splits up. Belgrano and her two escorts 
go straight in from the south and they do the real damage from behind. Um, so that's kind of kind of how the plan goes. Alara had given up at 2.50 and told everyone it was two hours and 10 minutes later. It was exactly 5 a.m. that Belgrano is told that everyone else gave up two hours, 10 minutes ago. So she's been steaming east for an extra two hours and 10 minutes, um, during which time she's now being followed because we could we could break the Argentine codes. In fact, there was a few things. Chile were helping us out um, with breaking the codes. Uh, the CIA, who owned the crypto AG machine, the um, um, kind of like the Argentine or the modern version of the Enigma machine, I suppose. The CIA actually owned the company um, <laughs> and we could decode it, but they were decoding it hours quicker than we were. And so they were helping us out. Um, we knew what they were doing. And at this point, um, we now get orders. She's going into the exclusion zone. In fact, when Belgrano decides, oh, God, well, the attack's been called off, she heads north. She's going straight towards the exclusion zone. And we realize we've got to do something. And so there was an order. Now, I will just put this in. There is no order that goes sink the Belgrano. That mm. did not happen. Um, what happened was that although on the, the 23rd of April, we had told Argentina through the Swiss embassy, anything inside the exclusion zone that will be sunk. Anything outside the exclusion zone, if it poses a threat, can and will be engaged anywhere. So Argentina knew this. They knew this. And you've got a cruiser with two destroyers, and those destroyers were potent. They had six five-inch guns apiece, uh, plus four MM38 Exocet missiles. You put those two and the Belgrano together, they outgun everything in our task force. Mm. Plus, they got the missiles and everything else, and they can all take a hit. You know, these were uh, ex um, Allen M. Sumner class American destroyers. They had armor. Ours had no armor. They could take a hit, and they could really dole it out. So this is a potent, be it aged, battle group who, if put in the right position, can do a heck of a lot of damage. We know this, and now the orders go to engage this task group. Where this falls down is people say, well, but then she was turning around the Belgrano. Yes, she was. But what people don't know, again, you being a Navy man, you all know this, submarines, certainly of HMS Conqueror's vintage, which she was not a young submarine, could not just sit under the surface transmitting. You had to surface yeah. to get... And the problem was Conqueror had massive communications issues um in fact we had to route most of our communications through new zealand they were helping us um just to make sure they were coming clearer and she couldn't in fact she had to download the message to attack i think seven or eight times because it was coming through in bits and they couldn't attack without being entirely sure what to do one of the problems we had was that although we had stated to argentina that everything if it posed a threat, even if outside the exclusion zone, it could be attacked. We had not changed our own rules of engagement to say that. So much as what we told them was not what we told mm. our own ship's captains that they could do. And we had this sort of urgent rush to change our own rules of engagement so that we could engage the Belgrano, which was done. And of course, in the interim, the difference between these messages being sent and the messages being received, decoded, pieced together, absolutely understood. There is a massive time gap during which one could argue, oh, but she was really sort of heading that way. Um, she was heading west. She was absolutely heading west. She was not going to port, however. The, the order to recall was not to port. It was to a specific holding area to try again. So people go, oh, she was going back to port. Captain Hector Bonzo with the Belgrano was very vociferous in this numerous times. There was no order to return to port. We were not going home. We were going to wait, see what was happening, and we would try again. They were still very much a threat. Why Why do you think people dismiss dismiss his sort of um, opinions on things? Because he's been very, not vocal, but he's been quite supportive of the British, and he's not, you know, been very like, oh, you, you know, you're pirates and criminals, like a lot of people like to say. Um why why do you think he gets dismissed in the in the narrative personally i think that a lot of the feeling has less to do with belgrano and more to do with thatcher i think she's she's one mm. of the she's a marmite character you either like her or you don't and i think a lot of people are only too willing to believe uh, you know thatcher had it torpedoed to to win an election to to um ruin the peruvian peace plan to you know whatever it was um 
And I think it's more to do with Thatcher um, and also to do with ignorance. People don't know what mm. Captain Bonsai said. One of the, You can read in old newspapers, but they don't. The people have fixed opinion. Yeah. And a lot of these newspapers are in Spanish and a lot of people don't read Spanish. I do, but a lot of people don't read it. And uh, some people can't even use the translation function. So um, a lot of people just repeat things that Gavshon and Rice said, mm. um, which, like I said, even even coming down to the book that Paul Cardin wrote, he's repeating it. Although Paul swears he never read Gavshon and Rice and never heard of them. He told me that. So I don't know how, you know, but he got his information off, I suppose, opinions online is where you where you read these these stories um but people don't look into it and i think that that again that is why we do the job that we do historians we go out there to say no you know, let, let's kill this old rumor off we'll investigate it mm. we won't just rubbish it we'll investigate it and say look this was it it was a order and again it's all in the book like i'm reading these orders to you it's there to go back to a holding area and to try again by that point she had become a threat she had become yeah. a military threat and needed to be engaged. Conqueror had her orders. She shadowed Belgrano for many hours. Every time she, you've got to remember, you've got two sub, two destroyers with, they've got a lot of anti-sub kit on them. It's not the most high-tech kit, but they've got a lot, a, a lot of it, you know, and a lot of bangy stuff. And um, they've got depth charge racks and launchers. They've got hedgehogs. They've got... Um, anti-submarine torpedoes they are well equipped if they got the rough gist of where to hit this thing they can give it a lot and so conqueror needs to you know she keeps near the surface have a look come down right i'm going to follow them to there have a look oh no she's trying to get out of the way get herself get the destroyers on the other side and come up and find a, a zero gyro angle shot at the belgrano and it comes down to even, you know, there, there were reports of overkill. Why didn't you use the Mark 24 Tigerfish? Because it was small. It was a small <laughs> anti-submarine topic. One of the things that you won't find out there, um, our Tigerfish torpedoes dropped from oh, dropped from helicopters, from ships, etc., were rubbish. They were rubbish. They didn't, didn't hit a damn thing throughout the war. Um, there was a good reason for that. It had a 100% failure rate. It had an annoying ability to um, to come back on itself and come and hit the guy who fired it. And there's a very, very, very good chance that we knew uh, Plessy over in Wales, they were part of Siemens Plessy, I think they're owned by Talis now, uh, were actually fudging their factory acceptance tests um, and saying that these torpedoes were good. They were not. They were using the wrong component, what's called a Fairchild chip. So they were actually fudging this, and MI5 knew about it. Did we know? I'm not sure. But certainly, I, I'm led to believe that the right people on submarines would have been told, don't use the Tiger Fish, you know, use a big <laughs> World War II-style Mark 8, which is 805 pounds of Torpex. And this is this is one heck of a big bang. Um, so again, you know, Tam um, DL, the... Uh, Labour member of parliament, oh, it was overkill, you know, et cetera, et cetera, wrote this book, Thatcher's Torpedo. It wasn't overkill. The Mark 24 wouldn't have worked. Um, you needed something really big like the Mark 8, and it, of course it, it did the job. But now you're on Conqueror. You have orders to attack. You don't keep popping up so as everyone can see mm. you. And in fact, she was seen. There was a man on the Belgrano who did say that there's a submarine out there. They did see her. Um, people said, no, that can't be. Don't worry. You, you know, just getting a bit twitchy or what have you. That was fortunate. Um, but you can't just keep popping up. Any new orders, guys? You know, sorry, I'll sit here for an hour because it does take a while to download <laughs> these messages. You know, well, while you're in attack position, you can't. She went deep. She kept, she did come up to periscope depth to have a look at her target and she engaged the target. And it's that is no war crime. That is no war crime. People say, well, why was there this disparity in orders? She had a broken antenna mast. You can read the Conqueror report. Chris Rafer Brown, her commander, is is ripping his hair out. And he didn't have a log. We don't know what mm. happened to the log of Conqueror. A lot of people say it was left at Fast Lane or it was left in Gibraltar. We don't know. But he kept his own. And he was very, very fastidious. In fact, it's better than a log. A log, you know, you can only scribble little bits. He had full freedom. He's got very witty anecdotes in it and things like that. And I quote this extensively he's literally writing the whole thing as he's going and was ripping his hair out about the communications problems by this point he's got orders to engage belgrano group 
he can engage any ship, but obviously the 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 leader of the the group is Bograna herself, and she's the easiest one to hit, and she can't really hit back. She wasn't very good with um, anti-submarine warfare, and so they engage the Bograno, and th- there is no war crime here. And going back to your question, why don't people listen to Captain Hector Bonzo, who was a very very intelligent man, a very studious man, mm-hmm. incredible captain, and um, he even said this was no war crime. This was yeah. no war crime. We were ready to fire. We were in re- receipt of orders to fire. We were not going back to port. It was uh, lamentably legal, is what he said. So why don't people listen to him? Because I think they have their own opinions. That's why. But opinion, you're entitled to your own opinions in this world. You're not entitled to your own facts. Very true. Um, like you said, it, it does um, It does annoy me that people, they they. Sp- spin the same narrative that you know it's been around for a while even though it has been disapproving and the other side have given their fact and opinion on it as well which you know marries up to the the you know the fact of of the matter you can't change you can't change yeah but nobody has ever really written this down you've got a newspaper report mm. you know it's the express copied it which is what the express do you know um the express copy so, so it's why would i believe the express i'll believe my own opinions nobody's ever Really, mm. since since Gavshon and Rice started the rumor mill rolling, nobody's ever actually done a book. There's been no book on the Belgrano, actually the Belgr- Belgrano, um, with her as focal point in the English language. There's certainly been no book on USS Phoenix, uh, mm. either here or or in the States, to my knowledge. So, you know, it, it was good to put all this together and actually say, no, here is a referenceable, quotable thing that you can say, here's what happened. Let's end the yeah. conjecture. This is why historians have a job. <laughs> um, but th- there's a lot more to it. I mean, the escorting destroyers spent years going, oh, no, we, we didn't run away. Yes, they did run away. And then when they said, oh, um, we did, but we we didn't see Belgrano because there was a heavy uh, sea squall and a mist and stuff. We didn't see her. Yes, they did. Both ships saw her. I've got a counter. They saw Belgrano floundering. They saw distress rockets, distress signals, and they both fled the scene. And the British said afterwards, one of the biggest problems was we didn't know that those destroyers were just going to leg it. A British destroyer yeah. would never do that. You'd go and help the guy, which they did throughout the war. The Argentine destroyers fled the scene and left Belgrano to her fate. And then by that point, the lifeboats have been launched. There's a massive storm. They are scattered everywhere. A lot of people are dying of their wounds, which would have been treated if they could have been picked up quicker. A lot of people die of hypothermia and other things. These people would still be alive if those destroyers were there. Um, But they fled the scene. They, you know, they decided to look after themselves. Hector Bonzo kind of grudgingly never blamed them, in fact. He just said his only answer every time he was asked that was, they had their jobs to do, I had mine. Mm. Um, So he never, uh, never blamed them for doing it. But... You know, there's a little bit in my narrative. I actually sort of get a tiny bit angry about it, and I was going to take it out. And I thought, no, I'll, I'll let that let that ride because that's very true. There's, you know, the, it isn't just the book doesn't go. And then Bograno was sunk. We look at the people inside it. What was happening when they got into the life rafts and even just surviving on deck? Uh, a lot of people getting off it were killed in horrible ways, and then finally getting into the life rafts. And then we follow the crew in the life rafts until they are recovered. Um, and in fact, in the very final chapter, which is called Gotcha, of course, the world's most infamous headline from the sun, we look at where all the rumour mill came from and we start tackling all those things. So it's it's an end to end story um, all about it, if you see what I mean. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Ricky, this has been a, a fascinating chat that it's absolutely flown by. It's been 53 minutes and no. I'm sure we could go for another 53, but I'm going to hand the plate over again, once again to you now for you to plug your book, your website, your Twitter, where can people find you? Where can they find your book? If they, if, you know, if they want a copy of it, I will link everything in the description of this podcast as well. Uh, and when I put it on YouTube as well, it'll be in that description as well. So floors back over to you, mate. Floors back over to me. Okay, so uh, firstly, so the book Phoenix and Belgrano, The Life and Death of a Warship by myself, Ricky D. Phillips. Um, Where to find it? Amazon. Amazon, the world's biggest bookshop. Uh, You can (laughs) follow me on Twitter, stroke X, it's at RDP History. Always the best place to get me. Um, And, you know, come say hello and interact. This isn't a buy my book page. You know, for those just getting into this, I, I do a 
a day by day rundown mm-hmm. of the Falklands War before and after as well. We're still unpacking the Falklands War. It's still going it on. Runs, yeah. It runs every year. It's the most popular uh Falklands War thread, the most read Falklands War thread in the world, of course. I'm I'm now the most read Falklands War historian in the world in the English language through print media, digital media, social media, you name it. Um come join in. And you know, if you know stuff, if you were there, if you add to it. Um it gets bigger and better every year by veterans adding to this. So it is a good thing. And one thing, it, my I always thank my readers, the people who were there since my first book, The First Casualty, Last Letters from Stanley, all the other books. The people who know my books already know this. The secrets you get, particularly in the historical notes, the stuff you get that nobody else knows um, from an RDP book is is always, you know, it's always wow, it's next level stuff. I don't just rehash someone's history. There's always something new. What are you going to find in this? Yes, you're going to find the help New Zealand gave us. Yes, you're going to find the CIA and the crypto AG. Yes, you want to hear something exclusive. SR-71A Blackbird spy planes. A lot of evidence on those. You're going to get that in this book. It is worth it just for that. Um, (laughs) And we look at a lot of that as well. Um, And follow and read. If you're a World War II fan, if you're a Falklands War fan, if you're a Warship fan, this really, really is a great book for you. It's technical specs and data. It's, you know, for the real techie geeks out there. And, and I am one myself. Um, it's naval history. It's human history. It's world. It, it's, it's got a heck of a lot going for it. It's, uh, it, it's the kind of book that needed to come out after 40 years um, of not doing this. And you know what? If you like what I'm doing, stay tuned for the next one. Because the next one, all these books, a bit like the Marvel series, suddenly <laughs> all link up and you realize why we are where we are. There's hopefully one due for next Christmas, which I found a few things that are going to absolutely blow your mind. One of the most senior British officers in the uh, Falklands War told me once, uh, if you knew the true story of the Falklands War, you'd have to rip up the books and start again from scratch. Um, This is as close as you're ever going to get to the book. But start with First Casualty, Last Letters from Stanley. Start with Phoenix and Belgrano you start to work out where we're going with this. There is a lot more to come, a lot more to unpack. And hopefully I will find you all on on the Twitter sphere. That's uh, the Twitterati is is, is all the people we're (laughs) we're hitting. You you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on uh, the Cora, big on Cora, occasionally on YouTube. But you will find me mainly Twitter, at RDP History. Um, Come say hello. Come join everyone else. Absolutely. And I'll I'll, uh, plug all your usernames and bio like I said, in the, in the description. Ricky, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, it's been well worth it. Well worth the wait, I think, uh, from my end, absolutely. Uh, thank you all for listening. We'll see you all very soon. And once again, thanks for Ricky for, for coming on the podcast. And thank hopefully you. I'll get him back on. Hopefully I'll get you back on for your uh, your next one as well. <laughs> I don't know. It's got a few minutes of history, not a few hours. I think we've, <laughs> we've pushed that one a bit far already. But uh, I really hope you and, and your listeners got something out of this. And it's, um, Absolutely. Uh, it's been a, a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you on the next one. Cheery bye.